It is my pleasure to introduce Joe Dreyer, who's also known as Joe King ATL. He's a multi-talented artist, architect, photographer, poet, who has made a significant impact on the creative scene in Atlanta, Georgia, and beyond. Joe considers himself to be a social artist, combining his multidisciplinary talents in a way that celebrates the people in his community. In describing his work, work as an artist, Joe said that there are no straight lines. And this is in contrast to his work as an architect. I think it's a description that neatly describes not just the appearance of his work, the themes embedded in that work, that life rarely fits into neat boxes, and that Joe has been able to give us insight into thinking about new ways of looking at life and new directions, directions that don't travel in a straight line. So without further ado, I'm going to switch it over to Joe. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Dreher. Um, I'm hoping that you can hear me OK. Yep. Great. Um, as uh, Jacob said, um, uh, I go by Joe King ATL. Uh, that's a moniker that was given to me um, uh, with volunteering with some artists. And uh, one of the guys from France kept saying, Joe, you're the best. You're the king. And someone came over knowing my first name was Joe and said, oh, you must be Joe King. And so uh, at that point, I became Joe King. And uh, the ATL obviously stands for my home base, Atlanta. Um, I am uh, all of those things, artist, architect, photographer, and poet. Hopefully you can hear some of the noise from the uh, swing stage uh, descending uh, on my large mural project last summer. Um, this is what it's like being on a construction site. Obviously you're talking and hearing all this other stuff going on. Um, I wanna address the, my titles there. You know, I think we all start out as artists. Um, I went to school to become an architect. I found that I loved, you know, uh, architecture taught me how to see the world differently. And I wanted to document that through my photography. And then I think the poetry comes with how we present that back to the world um, as our creative selves. And so I'm gonna see if I can get to my first slide here. Why is that working? Okay, sorry, bear with me one second. This was working just fine. A moment ago. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I was in architecture school in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, Jacob was a classmate of mine a couple years uh, below. Um, at that time, uh, architects were drawing and trying to make buildings that look something like this slide. Um, they were a mess, you know, uh, deconstructivism is what they called it. Um, paper architects uh, is what they were called as well. Um, so this was uh, one of my first projects at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, and it's obviously an interpretation of one of the school buildings there at SCAD. Uh, again, my slide's not advancing. What's going on here? I apologize for why it's doing this. All right. It's gonna have to go like this. Okay. Uh, this was my first professional project. Um, I started uh, working in Atlanta um, prior to the Olympics coming in 96. Um, this was a project for Motorola for their paging division, which sort of uh, gives you an idea how old I am, I guess. But um, this project was interesting because I was fresh out of school. I should have been doing, you know, uh, drawing bathroom elevations, but uh, the architect who was the project manager got promoted to a uh, vice principal. And uh, I was uh, assigned a structural engineer as my project manager. And he said, just make it look nice um, and we'll take care of everything else. So this was a, a 250,000 square foot facility in Chihuahua, Mexico, basically a giant pancake with uh, clean rooms and total white space interiors. And uh, one of the engineers came back. I didn't even get to go on a site visit. One of the engineers came back with a picture of the sunset 
and uh, he was photographing some power lines on the site and I saw the beautiful colors and I said this is you know the inspiration for the building for the design so what you see in these photos is about 10 percent 10 to 20 percent of the actual building the rest of it like I said is a giant pancake behind there um, as I progressed in my career uh, I got to do more and uh, more design work. Um, this is a building at Georgia Tech, a biomedical engineering building, uh, where my 3D modeling skills came in handy for uh, studying the solar uh, effects and the, and the sun shades. And, uh, and it really sort of developed my interest in color as well in architecture, which in architecture school seemed to be something that we shunned, you know, uh, only Corbusier could do color and it was through light and, and stained glass, right? So uh, I became interested in how I could incorporate it in my buildings to uh, show different areas of the building, different connections to the inside and the outside. And uh, so that became sort of a theme in the work that I was doing. Um, I think all this time I was sort of looking at a lot of these blank walls thinking, wow, well, th what, what could I put on those? And then, of course, it comes to this, you know, I, I, I started uh, to do some side work and design some houses and, uh, you know, designing some white boxes, uh, which now I would want to paint. Um, this was my first kind of real project that didn't get off the ground. I started my own practice in 2006. Uh, you know, and you all know what happened in 2007. So I had a really great first year, profitable first year, thought, you know, this is everything I wanted it to be. And then the bottom fell out. And so with the recession, uh, you know, I had to sort of reevaluate my career, my, my profession, you know, my, my, uh, my business. Uh, I shut the doors in 2008. Uh, after much struggles and clients not paying and, uh, you know, pretty much experienced financial ruin. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it made me realize what was important in life, and that was family and community and, you know, the things that don't cost money, uh, you know, uh, going out and seeing an art show or volunteering in my community. Um, one of the first projects I did uh, after I closed my practice uh, was a art competition to um, help promote uh, the Center for Civil and Human Rights, which they built here in Atlanta, uh, probably about, I don't know, almost a decade ago now. Uh, so this project was to create a fundraiser for a building that didn't exist yet, but to educate people on uh, what the building was going to be about. And it was also to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that some of you might know Eleanor Roosevelt wrote and was adopted by the United Nations. And is really kind of the basis that we judge all countries on how they treat their citizens, um, sort of like a Bill of Rights for the world. Um, so what I did to uh, get the word out was I said, well, I'm gonna print each of the articles on a t-shirt and then I'm gonna go out into the community and I'm gonna give that t-shirt to someone. I'm gonna take their photograph. I'm gonna get their information and I'm gonna compile that and present it uh, as a, a single a document. And so I called that ubiquitous loci. Uh, it's, the idea was it's the building is nowhere and everywhere. It doesn't exist yet, but it exists through these people and through them having to explain this t-shirt that I gave them. All right, what's going on again? Okay, so this led to me doing more uh, community outreach. And so I, uh, at the insistence of my wife and my son, I was kind of, uh, after that design, that graphic design project, I was sort of struggling to figure out what am I gonna do next? You know, I tried some teaching. Uh, there were no architecture jobs available at the time. I was really, you know, sort of in my own going through the recession, but struggling with my own depression. And really, uh, my son and my wife said, you know, this has got it, we got to put an end to this. And one of his teachers and a guidance counselor suggested we get out and we volunteer with this program called Living Walls here in Atlanta 
that works with international artists to paint murals in the city. So this is an image looking up uh, from the street level to the artist on the lift with an extension pole. And he's essentially got a brush on the end of that that he's using to draw his design on the wall. I really apologize, but it just doesn't seem to wanna advance my slides. Okay, there's my son right there in the front with the iRobot ATL shirt on. What I love about this image is uh, not just that my son is in it, but that if you look in the back on the lift, you'll see a lean to. And the artist, when I got there to help out, I realized he was painting in the sun all, he was south exposure, the sun was beating on, on him all day. He was really suffering with the Atlanta heat. And uh, I said, you know what? Let me grab some paint poles, a tarp, and I'll make a lean-to and provide him with some shade. And for me, you know, now when I talk to architecture students, I talk about how this was such a moment for me. It was like all, it was a culmination of my, my career as an architect, my education of an architect. It, you know, in the most direct way, I, I provided somebody with shelter. Um, I, you know, I did my job as an architect. Uh, what I what happened though is that as a father, I kind of stepped back from my role as dad and supervisor, and and just sort of watched my son kind of uh, learn how to spray paint and learn, you know, ride a scissor lift and participate and really um, discover you know, uh, what community is. Uh, I think up until this point, he was a typical teenager, kind of in his bedroom at night, drawing in his sketchbook, doing his homework, and kind of feeling a little different and alienated from all of his classmates because he was creative. And um, this getting out and meeting other artists, I think made a huge difference. In fact, that night we were invited to a dinner with the all the artists and the volunteers and midway through the dinner, he came up to my wife and said, Mom, I feel like I met my people today. And of course, we got goosebumps. And, uh, you know, we decided that we've got to dive in head first to this. And for me, it was uh, experience that I hadn't really realized as an architect. I think architects tend to uh, be a little bit more private with their, you know, design ideas or whatever. And these guys were as interested in what my son was drawing in his sketchbook as what they were painting on the walls. And I just found it a beautiful uh, experience to be out in the community and see the support and the interest from the people in the community in what was going on. And so I started to document that. I documented my son's experience. I documented the community members that were coming out to show their support. Um, and for me, that was almost more important than the art that was there. But what the art was doing was, I think, showing people that with a little hard work, with a little effort um, and some organization, that they could make real change in their community. In this case, in a couple of weeks, you know, they had this beautiful, colorful mural. But I think it inspires the community to take up arms and, and say, you know, if, if they can do that, then we, what can we do? And so these are some of the people in the community that would come out and volunteer and participate. And of course, you know, as a photographer, I'm kind of watching all this going on and the composition and, uh, you know, just the, the way the artists are painting these murals is, is, is kind of architecture to me. Um, this was the first mural that I painted. I was at the gas station filling up my car and I went up to pay the attendant and I see this young gentleman who I later uh, came to know as Brian. And he had this hat on that said Atlanta. And I said, could I take a picture of your hat? Which I would often use that as a way to photograph strangers or people I, I didn't know. Um, Brian, you know, said this hat and pointed to his hat. And uh, I went on my way and uh, came back, you know, to download the photos, came home and downloaded the photos on my computer, which you used to have to do. And uh, I saw this image and it really spoke to me. It said something about Atlanta, uh, the city of Atlanta and how you know, we're the center for you know, uh, civil rights. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, we've got the largest disparity between the upper class and the lower class. 
uh, right across the street from the King Center downtown, you'll see people sleeping, you know, essentially in the gutter on the street. Um, so, you know, homelessness, uh, you know, racism, all these issues are still present in Atlanta, um, even though, you know, I mean, this is the birthplace of Martin Luther King. Um, so for me, this image kind of captured this mood. And this, this is pre-Black Lives Matter movement. This is pre-George Floyd. This is pre-all those kind of occurrences and the kind of mediation of, uh, of young Black men being, uh, being shot. Um, and so I called Brian up and I said, Hey, Brian, I'm going to paint that photograph. Cause I went back and I, you know, I, I, I met him. I got his name. Um, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, you know, image, but eventually I want to do something with it. It really speaks to me. It took a year before I got the opportunity to paint my own mural. And that was really through the volunteering I was doing. One of the artists, you know, said, look, you've got the skills, you know what you're doing. You ought to be painting your own own stuff. But unlike my son, I was not, uh, you know, I was drawing buildings, you know, for the past 20 years, and I wasn't drawing characters and figures from my imagination. So I really didn't know what to paint. Um, and so this artist said, you should paint one of your photographs. And instantly the light bulb went off. And I said, that's it. I'm painting Brian. I called Brian. I couldn't reach him. I left him a message. And I said, Brian, I'm painting your portrait. I think he thought I meant a little canvas, you know, a little eight by 10 or something. And then he started to see the posts on social media. And he called me uh, practically in tears, you know, saying like, you don't know what this means for me. Uh, I feel immortalized. Uh, I can bring my young son here, you know, uh, to see his father 30 feet tall on a wall. Um, and at this time, too, uh, young Black men being painted on walls around Atlanta wasn't a common thing. You might see a painting of a civil rights leader like Martin Luther King or somebody like that. But just Brian from the gas station, you know, uh, that wasn't happening. And so this, for me, like, I thought originally I was just painting a photograph. And then I realized, no, I'm, I'm painting a person. And uh, this is bigger than I even thought it was. What happened is people started to come. There's Brian with his son. And uh, and I kind of adopted my signature. Instead of signing my names on my murals, I wanted the murals to be more about the people in them or the communities that they were in. So I just started using a Basquiat-esque crown. I kind of geometricized or archetized it um, to make it my own. But uh, and then I later got the opportunity to paint a mural uh, for a Basquiat exhibit here at the High Museum. But what I found beautiful about the crown as I did more research on it um, is that it doesn't originate with Basquiat, that this idea of the three-pointed crown was something that graffiti artists actually used. And he got his start as a graffiti artist. And it's a, it's a compliment that graffiti artists give each other to say you're the you're the king of the the town or the king of the subway yard or the you know the king of the graffiti you know crowd here or whatever, um, so that's the way I started using it in my work as a way to kind of elevate and celebrate people. Um, so I didn't really set out on that path, but it's sort of from that first project painting Brian, uh, it became evident that if I'm going to do something, it needs to have kind of meaning and purpose and it needs to be intentional. And so that mural has gotten adapted and modified over the years. It had a mask on it during the pandemic. Um, I added the Black Lives Matter after George Floyd, um, you know, and it actually had a vote uh, message on it at one time as well. Uh, and then, so, okay, I've painted a mural now. And, you know, a big part of that project for me was about showing that I could do it for practically no cost. A lot of people were saying, well, I, I don't have the resources to paint a mural. You know, it's, uh, it's gonna cost me $10,000 or $20,000. And I'm like, I got some black paint donated, uh, a, a can of primer and a ladder. And I went out there and did it in a couple you know, weeks. And, uh, and I was able to do it for practically no cost. And so this was another project where I was meeting uh, an uh, Instagram group called We Love ATL. And I had stopped at a yard sale on the way to the meeting and I bought a, a, a I don't know what you call it, but a ball of twine, I guess, or a ball of yarn. And um, 
while I was waiting, I was early for the meeting, while I was waiting, I started to just tie the twine and knots in a heart shape um, on this gridded fence on the belt line. No signature. I mean, it took me about a half an hour to do it. It was beautiful because as you can see on the left side, left of the slide, when the wind would blow, the string would come straight out and it was like the heart was beating. It was like moving out and then falling and you know extending and falling. Um, but what was interesting is that without letting anybody know I did it or posting it or anything, I started to go to Instagram and see in my feed, people were taking photographs of it and they were posting it and eventually figuring out who it was that did it. And, you know, it's for, for me, it was going viral, but I, you know, it wasn't like it went viral nationally, but I realized more the power of what I was doing, putting things in public places um, and the effect that that might have on people. And that if I'm going to do it, I've got to do it purposefully, right? And so uh, this was the project that I was there meeting this group we love ATL about. And this is using some of my architect skills. I created these outdoor gallery spaces. So on the inside of these spaces are framed photographs. But in some of the frames, it's just the cutout. So you actually, in all these images, you're looking through the cutouts at the people on the inside looking at the photographs, and in some cases, looking outside at you or other vignettes of the city. Uh, this is an interesting project because I, I was interested in the idea of how do I represent people? How uh, do I give everybody a chance to participate? And so I was asked to do a project for a, a marathon, or they called it a jogger 5K. And it was fun because the winner was not the person who finished first, but they were the person who uh, they when they took the winning time and the and the last time and put it in the middle, it was the average person that won. Um, but this is essentially like a giant stamp pad with a stencil and all the runners would run across this and they would essentially leave their soul print um, on the. On the. Um, on the stencil. And so after all the runners passed the, the starting line, I ran to the finish line and held this up for them to see that what they had been doing at the, at the start of the race and what they had made, which is essentially uh, I've captured all their souls uh, <laughs> on this, on this uh, piece of paper. Um, this is my first opportunity to really like go from a wall to a building, right? So the other wall you saw was a retaining wall for the railroad company. And so above it, it had the railroad tracks, the CSX lines. Um, so this was an opportunity to do an exhibit in a space. Uh, it was a frame shop and a gallery. And so the guy who was curating the show is a, like a local Atlanta historian kind of icon. Um, and so I represented him on the facade of the building. Uh, as a way to really get him to uh, let me be part of this this exhibit. Uh, what I exhibited were pieces that, uh, you know, from my architecture background, I was going around and salvaging old windows and doors out of abandoned buildings here in the city. Um, and then I was, the, the image on the windows is actually etched, so it's scratched. It's, the whole window is painted white, the glass included. And then I'm using a razor blade to draw uh, on the glass. And then on the on the door there, that is a photo transfer. So I've essentially uh, using bond paper and an architectural, you know, type blueprint printer. Uh, I'm using a carbon, you know, Xerox to transfer the carbon onto the paper and or onto the, the, the wood of the door and then uh, wipe away the paper. And that's what's left behind. Uh, this is another opportunity I had to paint um, an electrical box. They put out a call for artists, and this box was located next to the Kroger where I go food shopping. And I knew one of the young men that was a bag boy there, and his mother was a friend of ours, and she had raised him uh, by herself uh, and uh, got him through school, got him educated, and got him his first job there at Kroger. And so really this is more for her than it is him, but this is, this is when the Black Lives Matter movement had started. And uh, what I was feeling personally was like, 
a lot of attention was going to these men that we had lost. And it's unfortunate, I agree. But I also felt like maybe if we celebrate the young Black men that are with us then and respect them, then we won't lose as many of them. And so this was an effort to kind of not counter uh, Black Lives Matter, but to, uh, I think, just go alongside uh, that movement in a way that focused on uh, positive action. Um, and so this is Calvin, and uh, this is really kind of celebrating him. And uh, like I said, it's probably more for his mother than for him. Um, and then I started, you know, using spray paint and trying different things. And this was for an event uh, where the, the organ organizer was called Deer Bear Wolf. And so I combined all those terms and created this, uh, this new creature, a deer bear wolf. Uh, but what I was really kind of interested in this kind of, was this kind of same kind of multi-layered or, or transparency or uh, like you would find in drawings, in architectural drawings. When I was in school, you know, it was it, it, we were still drawing on drawing boards and drafting and we were, it was the advent, you know, we had the first kind of computer room and, uh, that kind of CAD setup, and so we were making that transition, which I found very kind of I'm very fortunate now to to experience that. I think because one of the things I find with the younger generation when they're drawing on the computer is there's a tendency to zoom in and zoom in closer and closer, and you get kind of lost and absorbed in the details, and you sort of lose the big picture. And one of the things I learned as a mural artist is that an artist told me there's two walls, Joe. They said, there's the wall when you're a foot away from it, painting it. And then there's the wall from across the street. And he says, you have to paint like you're standing across the street or else you'll never finish. You'll be, you know, you'll be trying to make everything perfect. So there's that kind of idea of like, what, what's enough for the eye to see, you know, from a distance. And not that it doesn't have to look good up close too, but all those things I think play into architecture and, and drawing and drafting. And so that's what I was really exploring here. And the idea of superimposition and the palimpsest where you, you know, you have layers and layers of erasures and then writings on top of that. This is also the first time I painted an image that wasn't my own image. I was, I just happened to be in Miami during Art Basel. I ran into someone I knew just on social media. He said, hey, I've got this wall, you know, I need artists to fill it up. And, uh, and so I, I went through my photographs and I wasn't really feeling anything. And then I was on Facebook and I saw this friend of mine who's a, a social activist up here in Atlanta. And I called her up and I said, Do you, would you mind again <laughs> if I painted your portrait? And, uh, and she said, no, that would be great. And two weeks later, she was on a plane coming down to see it. But uh that, I mean, it's for me, that's a really special thing when you can do that for somebody, right? Like that's not, that's usually something that's reserved for celebrities or athletes or politicians, you know, and, but to just take a regular person out of the community that really probably deserves a mural or deserves to be represented in that way and really celebrate them. And so this is a, a drawing a study for a mural I did for a campaign called Education is Not a Crime. Uh, it started as journalism is not a crime, and, it, and it's from the story um, of Rose Rosewater um, about the journalist in Iran that was imprisoned for 14 months um, for covering a protest of the Baha'i people who aren't allowed to be educated. They're not allowed to meet in groups, and they're not allowed basically to receive an education. And so he started this program, and it became an international mural painting program to celebrate and represent, you know, education. Uh, and so this image that you're looking at is a friend of mine, Charmaine and her two daughters. And the idea is that when you're young, you, you know, everything is, is big and you look up at the world and you see everything from down below. When you're a teenager, you know, you, you, you look out at the world and you see the world looking back at you and you become self-aware uh, and then when you're an adult, they tend to be the ones that are more pessimistic and grounded. And so they're sort of holding uh, the girls down 
but they've got wings and they've got a book and they're learning and that's what's going to elevate them and uh, make them soar. So this is a, a woman that I met in Nashville. I was visiting Nashville uh, to look for walls for another project. I just happened to see this woman on the street. It looked like she was wearing every piece of clothing that she owned. Uh, I went over to just say hello and started talking to her. She told me her story that she was a classically trained singer. She was living with her mother. Her mother passed away and the family, you know, sold the house out from under her. And she basically found herself homeless and with only knowing how to, to sing and uh, not able to find a job. So uh, I, you know, I wasn't sure whether to believe her or not, but she said, you know what, I'm going to sing for you. I'm going to prove it. And she started singing for me. And I just felt like, wow, what a gift that she had and what a gift to share it with me. And what could I do for her? Well, I, I didn't have any cash or anything on me, but I said, if you don't mind, I'd like to take your picture. And someday, you know, I hope to do something with it. This seems to happen to me regularly at this point. But, uh, you know, a little while later, uh, here in Atlanta, we have this uh, newspaper called Creative Loafing, and they have a, a Best of Atlanta uh, award, uh, and there's different categories. And one category was uh, the number one thing to hide from your out-of-town guests. And the people's choice was the homeless. And I thought, boy, is this really the Atlanta that I know, that I'm part of? Like, that that would be chosen as the thing to hide from your out-of-town guests? Like, and it made me really think like, you know, it's such a complex problem and there's no one solution, but the solution is not to ignore it and not to hide it. Um, the solution is to acknowledge it and try to find ways to help. And that it's going to be different in every situation. But my goal with this piece was to just represent her. And I was fortunate to do it in a location that was across the street from a church so every Sunday, you know, the, that church is rocking. It's a Baptist church and they're singing and praising Jesus and uh, the doors open and there she is. And I, I can't think of a better way to have represented her and to celebrate her. And I know that she may never get to see this or never realize it, but hopefully just having her on that wall will uh, inspire somebody else to not look away next time. Uh, this is a, a project I did called the Black Baby Project. It was a collaborative project with a printmaker at Georgia State University. And this is an image of his son uh, when he was born and in, in his hospital swaddling cloth. And he gave this to a number of artists, I think around 50 artists, to do their interpretation um, to decorate the essentially the swaddling cloth. Um, some people painted it orange and, you know, one artist painted orange and put, you know, uh, DOC on it, Department of Corrections. Uh, another person, you know, kind of made them like a, a rap star or an, a basketball player or athlete, you know, and I was kind of really trying to look for some other way to, to send a message or to, to, to you know, uh, express my feeling about it. And so what I did is I, I enlarged it to an eight foot tall image that then I wheat pasted to a piece of plywood and cut out. And for me, that was enough. I didn't need to decorate it. I just needed to make it big so that you couldn't ignore it. Um, again, like it's like the elephant in the room or with the homeless woman, it's like, she's now 30 feet tall on a wall. So stop ignoring uh, what's going on here. And then after George Floyd, uh, uh, was murdered. Uh, they had a, a woman's or mother's march here in Atlanta. And I decided to paint the American flag on the swaddling cloth. Because what I was realizing is that there was this kind of extreme patriotism that was going on in our country. Um, and that was having an effect on people that was almost as intimidating as the Confederate flag. And uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the people I knew here in Atlanta, if they saw too many American flags, it would make them nervous. And I thought that was really odd because my, you know, having been a veteran and uh, my kind of perception is that the American flag should be for everyone and it should feel, you know, we should feel protected by that flag. And that's why I chose to do this. And so 
I took it down to the protest. I put some leather straps on the back of it and they were able to march with it. And, um, and again, like I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to use my art and my voice in a way that I couldn't always do as an architect. And so uh, I think when I became an artist and I realized that what I was doing had to have purpose and intention, uh, I, I just kind of gravitated. I didn't set out to be a, 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 a you know, social justice artist, but it just sort of happened um, through the process. And so using, in this case, Andy Warhol soup cans, you know, I've made a, uh, a, a poster or wheat paste to promote voting. All my voting work, I never say, you know, who to vote for. I just want to encourage people to vote, encourage them to use their, their voice and they use that opportunity. Uh, this is sort of an example of my process. Like uh, this is a gentleman came from nothing. I photographed on the streets of Atlanta, Edgewood Avenue. Um, it instantly reminded me of this image in the middle uh, from the civil rights movement, I am a man. And so I took the two and combined those added the American flag in there and, and made I am a vote. And this hung over uh, the swag shop, which is a barber shop on Edgewood Avenue where Killer Mike, uh, the, the rap artist, uh, has one of his businesses. And then again, I'm borrowing from people in this case, uh, is it Robert or Richard, Indiana, you know, the famous love sculpture uh, translated into a vote. And then you've got John Lewis with a mask on his face because this was the election during the pandemic. Um, and again, like I'm fascinated about the, the buildings that I'm able to put work on. Sometimes they're in this kind of condition, but uh, the art kind of speaking to the architecture, uh, the underlying section of the I am a vote is actually where a window was filled uh, with cinder blocks. And to make my job easier, all I had to do was run my, ro my paint roller across the brick ledge that was sticking out, the face of the brick ledge, and line up my letters above it. And so uh, stuff like that. I know it's, it seems uh, <laughs> obscure, but you know, for me as an architect, that was part of the fun of it. Uh, this is a project I did for Black History Month. And you know, while we celebrate Black History Month in February, uh, there has there's this tendency in some places to have it end exactly um, at the end of February. And so I was given this project and this historic wall. As an architect, I had to write a letter and say that what I was putting on it wasn't going to damage it in any way, and that I would be able to remove it at the end of February. So. What you see on the right side there are some remnants that I was able to salvage and create some new artworks with. And there's some more of that. And then this leads to this uh, technique, the blotted line technique, which is something actually Andy Warhol used as an artist. He would draw with a fountain pen and he would put the paper in a, in a book and every so often before the ink dries, he would squash the, the pages together of the book and it would cause the ink to bleed around. And I, I was fascinated by this because as Jacob said in the introduction, like my, my goal now as an artist is to not draw any straight lines and to uh, create a process that really feels comfortable for everybody, any age, you know, uh, any artistic ability, I mean, the number one I th thing I hear when I ask people to participate in my project is I'm not an artist. And I tell them, we're all artists. You know, <laughs> it's, it's ingrained in us. It's not, uh, some are better than others, but we're all on a journey in life. And we're all, you know, just like architecture. You know, we, it, it takes many years to develop certain skills, but everybody sort of starts with those same skills. Um, so this process I originally did for foster kids and their foster parents. I was asked to develop a, a project where, um, you know, the, it would, uh, it was an event called Connections. And what I discovered in doing the research on these type of projects is it tends to be a room full of people. They've got a canvas or they've got a mug they're decorating or they've got some object that they're focused on, but they're not focused on each other. And so 
because this event was called Connections, because I was myself a foster child that ended up being adopted, um, it really kind of was important to me that I create a project that would encourage them to look at each other. I remembered back in my architecture education, and I, I believe it's Corbusier who said it, and don't, you know, don't hold me to it, but uh, to draw it is to know it. To draw something is to know it. You have to study it. You have to look at it. You really, it's a kind of intimate thing. And once you've drawn it, you should understand it a little bit better. And so that's what I was trying to achieve through this process. So with an empty picture frame, or in this case, a retail storefront during the pandemic, I was able to either have people draw each other, but in this case, for me to draw them from the safety of inside this space, while they could be outside masked or unmasked, this was sort of when people were starting to come back out again and weren't quite sure whether they wanted to have a mask on or not. But I was able to draw them without a mask or add a nose and a smile on there. Um, and I was able to create community at a time where community was really hard to create, right? Because we didn't want to be close to each other. We were scared to be close to each other. Um, so throughout the day, every day for nine days, I drew people as they passed by on the street onto the window. I would stop at dinner time, go eat, and then I would come back and I would tie it all together with some colorful background or uh, brush strokes, you know, to kind of make it into a, a, a overall composition, like a one composition instead of the individual faces. But the next morning I would come and I would wash the window and wipe them all away. So of course you can see the metaphors of, I'm not the same person today that I was yesterday. Every day is a new beginning, right? And to provide people with a portrait, you know, is also a special thing. It's special when they draw each other, it's special when I draw them, but like a portrait is something that's typically reserved for the upper class, for the Aristotle, you know, um, the wealthy. And so it's not something that you normally have, you know, the opportunity to experience. So I love that this process makes it easy. It makes it easy for me. It makes it easy for them. So over the period of nine days, I filled up this retail space with the prints that I was able to make. And I was making two prints. Um, so I would make one, hang it on the wall, and I would make one usually and give it to the kids or the, the people that I was drawing. That process led me to realize like I'm not just drawing individual portraits but what's happening as everybody's doing these drawings and I'm doing these drawings is we're actually creating a portrait of a community and so the idea of likeness you know that what is a portrait really especially a portrait like this that's a you know blotted line it's not about being perfect it's not about being exact it's not about being photorealistic it's about representation it's about a person feeling seen. It's about a person seeing themselves maybe in another person's image, you know? Um, when I talked to these kids, when I went to the, the Bellwood Boys and Girls Club, I was just instructed, they, you know, they want you to paint a mural, but they want to tell you what to paint. And I said, okay, well, what do they want to paint? And they said, they don't know. You're got, you got to figure that out. <laughs> So, you know, we went through a process of, you know, talking about community and talking about heroes and what the difference between a hero and your community is and a superhero. Um, we talked about words that represent the community, but ultimately what I kept hearing from the children was, we don't feel represented. We don't feel seen. We're kids, you know, the adults don't take us seriously. When we look around our community, you know, it may not be the best community in Atlanta, but we love it. It's our home. And when we see buses and billboards, you know, in our community that have people and places that don't look like us or that we'll never or maybe get to see or haven't, you know, ever seen to this point, like that's not what we want to see. We want to see ourselves represented. So this project, the, the Portrait Partners thing that I developed, it really works great for giving the kids an opportunity to participate and to see themselves. And this, this mural actually is painted on a material called polytab. Um, I think it has some architectural uses, but it's also, um, it's essentially like a canvas that can be used outdoors and it can be painted 
in any um, you know in any place like we painted on tables inside the uh, gymnasium and it, we cut it all up into five foot squares drew the image on there the kids came in they were able to kind of fill in the shapes not really knowing what they were painting or making you know just seeing uh, these colorful kind of abstract forms and not till I was able to go out and start gluing them up on the wall and it start to, to come to life to see like, oh, that's my face or that's my drawing that's actually in the mural. So they really, I think this, you know, I couldn't have them up on the, the scaffolding and the lift with me, but this is the closest I could come to actually having them create the mural with me. And in my mind, if you can include the community in that way, then the mural is not my mural, it's their mural. They take ownership and possession of it. And so they take pride in it and they preserve it. And the, the kids that are in this picture, their parents you know, went to this boys and girls club and, uh, and maybe even their parents' <laughs> parents. Um, so it's something that it's, it's generational even. And that to me starts to divine and represent community in a way where people feel seen and they feel represented in the place that they are. Um, and I don't know what more you could ask for. So we had two special um, volunteers uh, with the kids that were helping us and kind of keeping the younger kids in control and uh, helping us do the painting. And so what we did is I photographed them during the day uh, when they were there. And then when they left to go home at five o'clock and they picked up from their parents, I stayed most of the night and painted their image on the on the front and the back of the Salvation Army building so that when they came on the bus the next day after school, they would see their face on the wall and wonder, how did that happen? How is that possible? How could that even, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was not there yesterday and it's there today. And, and that's for me was like one of those things, seeing their reaction to that and seeing that magic happen, you know, like that's priceless. That's reason enough to be doing what I'm doing. And so when people ask me, like, are you, uh, you know, you're a trained architect, a licensed architect, do you ever regret like, you know, not practicing architecture anymore? It's not that I don't want to practice architecture. It's just not what I'm doing right now. You know, Buckminster Fuller said, we are not nouns, we are verbs. Um, you know, we are actions. We are what we are doing at the moment. And as long as we're 100% present and intentional about what we're doing, then, you know, what more could you ask for? This is a coincidence. I didn't plan this, but, you know, when it's photographed from the back of the building on the, on the football field, the tree actually completes the mural and her hair. Uh, this is a project at the High Museum here in Atlanta. Uh, this was the first time I actually implemented someone else's work. So this is a Solowit piece. And uh, I was part of a team that installed this work. And what's beautiful about Solowit is uh, they call him the grandfather of conceptual art, but really his thing was the democratization of art. What he believed is that he could make it, you know, and this is the closest thing to an architect as an artist you could be is he created essentially a set of blueprints and specifications that outlined how to execute these murals of his, these wall drawings, as he called them. Um, and then he let other people create the work. And what I was talking about with Saul Lewitt is basically um, the democratization of art. And the fact that um, what Saul was doing is essentially what an architect does. And he was creating a set of documents, uh, essentially blueprints and specifications so that other people could execute his work, which is quite genius as an artist, especially now one that's deceased. His work can live on and can be executed. Uh, his wall drawings, his sculptures um, can be built by other people and communities uh, using those, those drawings and documents. All right. And then these are just some details of that. Um, this is some sculptural work I was doing using my old dress shirts since I'm most of my shirts are t-shirts now with paint on them. Um, this is an interesting project as an architect um, and an artist. I was uh, given a site. I wanted to paint a mural 
but and I thought I was going to be able to, but when I got there, they said, or you know, when when uh when I started doing the design, they said, well, actually, you can't paint on that wall. Um, that's you know a historic building. We don't want it painted on. Uh, we prefer that you do something you know sculptural in the in the lawn in front of it. And I was like, oh, okay. I was planning on a mural, so I took some photographs of the kids I was working with here in Atlanta, and I created these giant portraits of them. These are about twelve foot tall, just jigsaw cut out of uh, Luan, you know, like quarter inch plywood with a kind of structural frame built behind them of one by ones. And then just a, a giant, you know, shop light that projects uh, through them at night and creates a shadow on the wall. So what you're actually seeing on the wall is just light and shadow. So you have a sculpture during the day that stands alone. And then at night, that sculpture projects onto the wall and creates a, a, an image without paint. Um, that led to a commission in Charleston where I went and worked with five elementary schools and the Boys and Girls Club to do the portrait partners project with them, uh, collected drawings of the kids, photographs of the, the botanical life in the, in the gardens and the park. And then I created the sculptures, which again were projectable. I used wood and plexiglass. Uh, I etched into the plexiglass the drawings that the kids had done, and then the main portrait was one that I had done. And this image on the architecture is uh, it's one of the four corners of justice in Charleston. I had a truck that had a, you know, a, a power outlet in it, and I was able to plug my shop light in on the side of the road and just pull this out and project it um, without any kind of permission or asking <laughs> if I could do this. I was just uh, testing it out. Uh, because ultimately what I wanted to do is the image on the right was have them lit in the park. So at night, these sculptures would go from being eight foot tall to being, you know, 80 foot tall. Um, and these were at the, the four main rows that went into the park. The Hampton Park in Charleston is surrounded by the Citadel, the uh, old stables, and then the athletic fields. But on the, on the south side, it has four avenues that drive up. So these four sculptures were designed to be at the end of those avenues. Um, I later got to exhibit them in Alpharetta at their new uh, art center there. Um, they're not projected here. They're more or less backlit. Um, so you can see some of the etching and stuff in them. Uh, I've also used, and this is kind of, again, through my interest in architecture and the processes that are in architecture now with the CNC routing and laser cutting. So this is essentially a piece of acrylic, uh, cast acrylic or plexiglass that's been etched and then painted um, so that the etch lines are transparent um, and then it's backlit. And it's the same image actually that was painted uh, the mural in Miami. And then this is a, a mural uh, at a church. I was told to you know, show diversity without, you know, uh, showing, you know, individual, um, you know, recognizable patrons or, uh, or members of the congregation. And so I did drawings and documentation of the, the congregation. And then I created these using this similar process uh, with the blotted lines and then uh, collage those all together. This is a mural this is the first floral mural that I did on a building. Um, and what's interesting about this mural is the site of this building is where a lynching occurred. And it was a lynching of a, a Jewish man. And it's the only known lynching in the United States of a Jewish person. Um, he was accused of murdering a young woman at the pencil factory. And um, he was sentenced to death. Um, but the Anti-Defamation League was formed, and they fought to get his sentence converted to life in prison. Well, the family of the young girl um, were not happy about that, and they say it caused a resurgence in the Ku Klux Klan. But anyway, they went and they took the, the manager, the Jewish manager of the pencil factory from the prison farm. I think it was in Marietta, and they brought him to uh, the location of the murder and they they lynched him there. And uh, the story 
has become more a focus on the Jewish community and the manager and the lynching. Um, and in that process, though, the story of this young woman, Mary Fagan, who's the kind of the original victim, has kind of gotten overlooked a bit. Um, so my idea, and it, it, I don't know if you're starting to see it in there, but if you look at the two flowers that are facing out that are blooming and gold, those are eyes. And then you'll see the kind of stems create a profile of a face where the leaf in the center are the lips and the chin below it. And so it was a way to kind of put a face in a mural where they didn't really want me to put a face. <laughs> Uh, they want me to put flowers. Uh, there's there's the image of Mary Fagan on the right, so you can start to see the relation. And it's one of those, I'm always interested in my murals being something that aren't one-liners, that you, as you see them, they sort of reveal themselves to you over time. And, and every time you see them, you might see something different. Um, but obviously, once you see it, once you see the face in it, you won't forget it. Um, this is my first kind of venture into uh, painting inside an architectural space, and it was during the pandemic, and it was while the building was essentially empty, so I was able to come in and safely work without, you know, people occupying the building, um, so instead of being able to use people for the first time, I sort of had to just rely on, you know, my kind of intuitive painting skills. So I really went full blown into the intuitive part of that. And I did what I call action painting, where I just use three colors. I use a magenta, um, a yellow, and a blue. And I mix the colors right on the wall. And it literally is action painting. Like I'm there, like almost choreographed, like a dance kind of jumping up and down and sliding the roller, sort of all the things that a professional painter would never want to see somebody doing I was doing but I was also incorporating these black lines and the um, the image of the these lighting fixtures that were in the space and so I was trying to pull architectural elements sort of out of the space and into the mural and create a mural that really kind of interacted and spoke back and forth to the, the architectural space that was in I wish I had a photograph to show you guys of people in the space but that's what brings it to life. It's a really active and beautiful and colorful, I think, mural. But when you see people on the stairs and you see people moving through it, it just, it's like the missing piece or it was the, the final piece that really completed the work. These are some images from outside the building looking in. Uh, and this is more kind of that same idea or same style of painting, really just kind of having the paint and just being kind of loose and free with it. And in this case, this was sort of a memo memorial piece uh, for a gentleman that passed away. And so, so that kind of transparent imagery. The transparency is something I picked up from Solowitz's process because he didn't use brushes or rollers. He used rags and you dab the rags on the wall, sort of beating them, tapping them against the wall or rubbing them like in kind of a circular pattern, like a wax on, wax off kind of karate kid thing. But what happens is same idea. He used basic black, red, yellow, blue, and created a whole spectrum of colors by layering transparent layers of those colors over top of each other. So what you can see in this mural that I'm doing here is that I've painted an abstract background but then I've created another layer on top of that that kind of looks like shattered glasses. This is my studio in Atlanta and it's on an active construction site. They're building buildings sort of all around it. And so it, it's meant to represent the scaffolding or the steel structure, but it also, it, for me, it's kind of a representation of the kind of broken window theory, which if you know a little bit about graffiti or, or about you know, criminal justice, broken window theory uh, was the idea that if you allow graffiti or graffiti you know becomes more prevalent in your community that that leads to other vandalism and and criminality um and it's actually the the opposite intent of the graffiti artists what the graffiti artists are usually painting on are abandoned buildings that are being occupied by vagrants and drug users and et cetera et cetera 
um, and by drawing on them, the city comes and cites them, the building owners and the building owners are forced to address, you know, those issues and bring the buildings up to, you know, code or um, have them inhabited. They're building all these mock-ups around my mural, so some of it's gotten covered up over time. Uh, these are two pieces I did for a law office here in Atlanta, kind of liberty and justice uh, were the two lobby pieces. This is a John Lewis piece. I use construction tools, actually spackling tools to create the image of John Lewis where I just drew the profile and then I slid the spackling, the paint with a spackling tool across the wall. Uh, this is sort of my first venture kind of back into uh, representing architecture. Uh, this is one of the buildings um, at my studio um, under construction, and it's sort of my interpretation or my vision of, of that building and that process. I built a giant, essentially like a perspective drafting table in my studio with strings, um, and so I would use the strings to create the perspective lines and a giant T-square to get all my other straight verticals and horizontals. Uh, this is the project I want to conclude with. This is sort of, for me, the full circle of what I've been doing for the past, and it's only really been seven years that I've been a practicing artist and muralist. Um, I was given this project called Midtown Union, and basically no other kind of direction as to what to paint on it. Um, and so I, you know, like many architects, I went to the vocabulary, to the words, and I was thinking of union and ways to represent that. And this image, which I think Jacob has tattooed on his body somewhere, uh, that Corbusier drew of the sun and the moon or Medusa and, uh, uh, and that idea of the union of the two. Um, and combine that with this geometric form called the Mobius strip, which is essentially if you take a rectangular sheet of paper and you do a half twist and connect the top and bottom, you create what was a two-sided surface turns into a one-sided infinite surface that you could put your finger on and just continually be on one surface, which seems like, you know, an impossibility or a paradox, but um, it's not. And so for me, that idea of taking a two-sided thing and making it one-sided was representative of the idea of union. Now, normally I would photograph people in my community or in the community where I'm painting because, um, again, as an architect, I think it's important to address the site, the context that you're in, right? So like an architect, I go into these projects with an open mind, and I really listen to what people are trying to say and try and give that a visualization so that they see their words become images, become representations, and so they feel not just seen, but heard and represented. Um, and so anyway, in this, in this case, I you know, couldn't use people uh, in the community. So my wife actually recommended, she's like, you know those two pictures of us from SCAD when you were uh, you know, in college and you took that photography class. She said, why don't you use those? You know, and it'll be about our union, you know, about our family. And what's beautiful about it is the reason I'm doing this right now, the reason I sort of came out of my depression after losing my practice is because of my family. You know, my son, um, who was interested in street art at the time and who was tired of me being depressed and, and you know, not being emotionally present, um, you know, he's the one who inspired me to get out and start doing this. And so to have an opportunity now to kind of celebrate through this medium, my family um, was a great, you know, uh, honor. And so there's two walls, actually. This one is about the union of myself and my wife. Um, and you can see the, you know, my architectural background coming through here. I really get into the logistics and the planning of the projects. This was on an active construction site. So I have to be you know, full safety gear, we're on swing stages and uh, suspended scaffolding and base scaffolding, you know, 150 feet up in the air. Um, each one of my team members, I had two assistants on this project because on the swing stage, you, you just, you have to have people operating the different motors. Um, so it's not something you can do alone. 
Um, but all that information, just like an architectural drawing. Again, this is what I'm seeing when I'm one foot away from the wall painting it, right? Like I have no idea um, of the scale or the, you know, what I'm actually, the image I'm creating. I'm just drawing boxes, essentially like a, a grid, you know, and filling that grid in with color and shape. And it's not until you get back from it. So you can see here, I'm, you know, a foot away from the wall drawing on it, but it's not until you get away from it that it actually means something. Um, and so, you know, it's a beautiful thing and you sort of lose yourself in these objects and these lines and shapes. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, you have to step back and you have to see the big picture. And I think that's important, you know, not just in art or architecture, but in life, right? Like life can feel so complex and everything about modern society is sort of about distraction and diversion and not listening to yourself. Um, at listening to you know advertising or listening to media um so really what i'm trying to say with my work and the, my approach is that we should be listening to ourselves and for me uh i don't consider myself not an architect anymore i just think i've found a new way to use my education and to use my skills that might lead me back to architecture uh, and actual buildings again um but you know it's uh, life's a journey and you just sort of have to go where it takes you sometimes and uh this mural got lights on it the architects and i encourage all the architects in the audience design spaces on your buildings these are on the parking decks the two parking decks but design spaces for murals because they're only going to enhance the architecture uh, this is the other mural. This is actually representing myself, my wife, and my two sons. Um, and as you can see, it's I've digitized it, uh, vectorized it, brought it in the SketchUp and MicroStation, calculated all my square footages so I knew exactly how much paint to order. Um, and then trusting the process with all this scaffolding up, we can't really see the whole big picture. So in this sense, it's really about trusting the process and knowing that if we draw what's in the grid and we transfer the drawing and, and we paint it, knowing we can only see one level at a time, that as we remove all that structure, all that kind of almost like chaos in front of it, what we'll be left with is, is, is what we had planned and, and put in place. Um, and again, just, you know, it was an honor for me and kind of coming full circle from starting on this retaining wall with the image of Brian and honoring him. And now that's, you know, eight years ago. Um, now I've represented my family and the people who've really inspired me to get to this point uh, in a mural. And then, you know, another beautiful thing to remember is the unexpected and the unanticipated, you know, uh this wall being an l-shaped wall led to some interesting things i'll show you in a video um but the reflections of the building the lighting the the street signs the urban environment that you're in you know like you're not in a clean gallery or a museum space you're out on a building on a street in a busy city and you never know what might happen this i think has some audio <laughs> Catching in the sunshine, if you look closely, what I think you'll start to see is the shapes and the lines actually appear to move and to come out off the wall um, as the faces turn and, and merge. And, and that just has to do with the light and dark, the juxtaposition of the different colors and shapes and that L-shaped wall that I was talking about. So something I had a feeling was going to happen, um, but not even to the extent that it actually did. And I hope you all got to experience that. And with that, I'll open uh, to questions and just uh, maybe switch my video on so you can actually see the person who you've been listening to. Hello, everyone. Hi, Joe. This is Heather. Can you hear me? Uh, very faintly. Okay, I can project. 
Thank you for sharing your wonderful work with us. I'd like for you to come please to Madison and do a mural. Yes, I would love that. I would I would love to meet people in Madison and work with them to create something together. <laughs> Great. I do have a, a few questions from our virtual audience. And then if you're in the in-person audience, uh, if you could please pause a second, keep your question in mind. I'm going to um, speak from the virtual audience first. And the first is just a, just a nice compliment to you, though. Um, Tom says, love this. I'm an art artist that is an architect as well. Great transition. Back to art. <laughs> nice. And from Glenn, he asks, how do the walls become available yeah, so I mean, one way they become available is by going out and driving around town and looking for walls that need some beautification, right? And that's part of the architect in me, right? Like I, I you see problems you want to solve, you see uh, opportunities that you want to design for, right? And so it's no different than, you know, when I was an architect, you know, and so now I'm just looking for walls to paint and, instead of, you know, sites to build on. Um, but yeah, like I'll I'll drive around. I might photograph a wall that I see, um, or I'll have an idea of what could go on that wall, and then I will come home and you know do a little photoshopping and a little sketching. And uh, I really like a layered process, you know, as you could probably tell in the the mural, especially the last murals. So I will photograph something and then I'll bring it in on my iPad. I'm not really great with Procreate and all those things, but I'll sketch on top of it. And then, um, you know, I might transform the photo, put a filter on the photo that limits the number of colors. And then I might delete one of those colors out of it um, so that you start to see the sketch through it and just start to build, build this layering, just like you would do in, a, in an architectural drawing, I think. You know, like if you're drawing a section, you might lay it on top of the plan and you're using the plan to, you know, like the, there's a the whole Corbusian, you know, uh, plan and section thing. And so, it's a very similar process for me is I'm like just collecting data and creating new data and putting it in layers and then seeing what happens if I bring this forward and I send that backward or, you know, I, I, I hand sketch on top of something and then I computer render something and just, you know, kind of get it to that point where I feel it's there's a level of complexity and a level of interest. And like I said before, like it's something compelling that you don't just read in one reading. It really, it's something that you have to look at multiple times or look at different parts of for it to really start to make sense and uh, and speak to you. Joe, hopefully you can hear me. We have a question from the audience. Yeah, I can hear you great. Hi, I really appreciated this and want to thank you and your family for your perseverance to get through your depression to be able to create something so beautiful and um, meaningful. And I was kind of think, you know, maybe you're this Calatrava of art, uh, having that background as an architect and engineer and then going into art. I mean, it seems like you're really coming up with some very unique, innovative, never been done before art would you say that's correct yeah i mean i'm definitely i'm not someone who i think has a style um i'm not really interested in style so maybe not like the frank gary of our of our you know but uh or you know but I, I just i for me it's about experimentation and i really approach each one of these projects especially the ones that i'm doing out in the public out in the communities like I would approach an architectural project, like it needs its own specific solutions. Um, and no two are gonna have the same needs or that, you know, have the same answers to those needs. And so for me, it's about what is needed for that project and then pulling upon my resources and my talents and saying like, okay, um, this maybe a mural works here, or maybe it needs to be a sculpture, or, you know, um, and maybe it's, you know, working with the kids in the community or, or maybe it's, you know, working with the adults. But it, it, for me, it's like every time it feels like a new beginning. Um, and then I think what just happens naturally over time is you start to see a pattern. And in my case, I feel it's 
not just a pattern, but it's a, more of a development, you know, like I was making those black and white light projected silhouette pieces. And then that led to like, okay, well, what happens if I add color and I make them out of plexiglass and then I shine lights through them, you know, and next I would like to do some where there are multiple layers of colors so that they actually start mixing and I can kind of create a full spectrum of colors uh, with light and shadow. And really the projection, you know, can be 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet. It's all based on the lumens that I'm using in, in the light source and the distance away uh, the sculpture is from the wall that it's projecting on. So for me, like all that part is the exciting, the architecture part of it, the logistical part of it, the problem solving part of it, the, you know, seeing a need and providing a solution. Like it's the exact same thing I was doing as an architect. Now it's just full of color and, you know, and beauty. And it's not that I couldn't, or I wasn't doing that in architecture because I think I was, doing that in architecture, but it maybe didn't feel, you know, uh, it felt like it took a lot longer, right? Like these projects were multiple years and quite often in architecture, you don't get to see, uh, you know, the clients actually using the building and experiencing the things that you designed, right? So you don't get that necessarily that same gratification out of it. Like I see these kids come out and see their faces on the wall and their faces light up and they feel special and they feel included and they're represented and, you know tear, it's, make, it's making me tear up right now just talking about it because it's so meaningful and I think you know part of the reason I became an architect is my dad who was an electrical engineer he liked to go on car trips and so we would often go to the air and space museum because he was into planes and astronomy and we would go uh, on the weekends, drive to Washington. And then when, when he would get bored in the Air and Space Museum, we'd go to the East Wing or, you know, we'd go to one of the other you know, natural history museums. But I was seeing architecture for free, again, like, like open and accessible to everyone, not, you know, VIPs, not, you know, private collection, whatever, um, not art hanging in somebody's, you know, house or uh, private space, but like out in the public for everyone to be able to see, you know, for no cost, all they had to do was have the desire and the ability to get up and go, go to those, see those things. Um, and I, I can't help but think that had a huge effect on me as a child. And then, you know, as I was sort of developing and figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, I was, you know, I was not a great student in high school. I, cause I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was creative kid and I, I you know, I liked to, to draw, um, but I didn't know how to make a career out of that. And my father being an electrician, you know, art's a hobby, not a profession, you know, and I had a friend that went to architecture school and came back and showed me what he was doing. And then the light bulb kind of clicked and it's like, oh, this is really creative and interesting. And I could do this and satisfy that career part of it for my, you know, parents. Uh, but also satisfy my creativity and my desire for that. And so I was fortunate to be uh, in Savannah doing training in the military, in the Air Force. And I, I took a tour of SCAD in its early days, you know, and uh, and I realized this is where I need to be. I need to, I don't need to be around other architects and engineers as much as I need to be around painters and photographers and graphic designers and illustrators and you know, and read poetry and, you know, do that. And, uh, and that really, I think, made a huge impact on me later in life, like now, because I realized, and even like after graduating architecture school, and seeing my friends go into many diverse careers, you know, uh, outside of architecture, but using their architecture education and their creativity to really kind of, you know, define their own paths or, you know, uh, own their, you know, specific interests. And so I never felt like, you know, I was so excited to get my license and to be able to, you know, say I'm an architect, right? Like it takes, you know, at least three years, right? You used to when you graduated before you could take your exams and all that time, you're kind of confused. Like, what am I? Like, you know, I'm, I'm an architecture intern. What does that mean? You know, like nobody's taking me seriously, right? Like, 
Uh, and as an architect, you know, nobody takes you seriously until you build something and you're in your 50s or, you know, it's, uh, and so, I don't know, it was important for me to have experienced that and to have checked that off and said, I did it, I passed those exams, I got my license, you know, uh, you know, I, I often think it's interesting, like, to be an artist, to be really like a, a you know, a scientist, to be a lot of things, you just have to call yourself that and do it, right? Like, I just went out and started painting and then I started calling myself an artist. Uh, you know, you start doing experiments and you can call yourself a scientist. It helps to have an education, of course, but um, but yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in like, just do it, you know? And a big, what I tell people a lot of times when they tell me like, how did you, how you know, how do you find these walls or how do you make these projects happen? And like such a big part of it is just showing up. I started showing up as a volunteer. I paid attention to what the artists were doing. Um, you know, I was observant. I, I picked up the, you know, the, the skills that I didn't already have. And then I just started doing, you know, and I mean, that's, that's, that's all, all it takes. It's no, there's no secret recipe. <laughs> Thank you. Just a couple more comments from our virtual audience. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. A little bit louder. I put my ear to the speaker. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not getting it. I'm sorry. My volume's all the way up. Joke? Yes. Can you hear this? Yes, I can. Let me turn my volume back down. Okay. Pamela says, wow, love the art and the backstory. She would like to see your art on a bus wrap. <laughs> and Lewis asks if you could talk about your po poetry. Oh, my poetry. Yeah, I didn't really include much of that, but you know, I just think, you know, as creatives, uh, you know, poetry doesn't just have to be words, right? Like, I think it's it's how we see the world, um, you know, as artists, as architects, as creatives, like we essentially put things out in the world that didn't exist before, right? Um, and I think uh, when you do that in a way that is respectful and intentional, it is poetry, right? And I, I do write poetry, uh, you know, one of the things, that, one of the sayings I like, you know, came up with that I like to tell people, I tell told my kids this is, I'm not a big advice giver, but I say, you know, when you travel, your perspective of the world grows wider. When you talk to someone, especially a stranger, your understanding of humanity grows deeper. Uh, when you do something kind for someone, it gives your life purpose and meaning. And if you keep an open mind and an open heart, there'll always be a place for you. Well, I think that's it. Um, Joe, thank you again for sharing all this work with us. It's pretty amazing to see this view of, uh, of life from uh, your perspective. And with that, I think we're going to wrap it up for tonight. Oh. And the next lecture, Holman and Heather will fill us in, give us a little preview. Sorry about that. Am I back? You're back, Joe. We're wrapping up. Thank you so much. Okay. We really Excellent. appreciate you your time. Did you get all that or you miss it? No, you're okay. Okay, uh, good. Heather good. was just going to let us know who's coming up next, and we wanted to thank you again. Make sure you know that we thanked you for sharing your, your work and your experience with us. Thank you. It was a really pleasure getting to share my story and I, I love any opportunity to do so. And uh, again, like I, I, you know, it's important what you put out there um, that you never know the effect it might have. And so if I can inspire one of you in the audience, then, uh, then I've, I feel good about what I've done. Thank you. That was good.